Um, all right, we're going to get started. Exodus 24 is where I'm going to start the first verse we're going to go to, but Revelation 20, the lake of fire is kind of what I was wanting to talk about tonight. And there are some folks that I know are, are, are watching, are going to be watching this video, and I hope it will help them and bless them because our goal here is to expound on the Scriptures or at least show some things in the Scriptures that maybe you're not used to. And we're always trying to share the reason that we no longer believe in eternal torment here. We didn't just wake up one morning and decide, hey, I don't want to... I'm not going to believe God burns people anymore. You know, that's not what happened. This is not a, a philosophy. This is not, uh, certainly not the traditions of men, as you all know. So where did, I've been even asked by a friend, where did you get this new religion? And uh, <laughs> I told him, I said, it's just new to you. And it was new to me because we've never heard it. But come to find out, it's the gospel Paul the Apostle preached. It's the gospel that even like I showed you last week in Old Testament writings taught the salvation of all hidden in the shadows of the Old Testament. This is not something God came up with at the last minute. This has been His plan from the get-go. And by God's grace, our messages are here to try to show people that or at least encourage them to study more for themselves and get into the Scriptures. Well, fire is something, one of those deals that a lot of times when reading the Bible, because we've got this pre-programmed understanding that God is going to burn people at the end of time. And so when we read fire in the Bible many times, and I'm going to show you some examples as we go, people misunderstand what it's trying to say. And I certainly believe that the lake of fire the great white throne judgment is one of those things, one of those places. And we're going to get started because fire in the Bible, when you read about it, it can be talked of in a literal sense or a metaphorical sense. And usually the context of the scriptures will determine, kind of give you an idea of whether it's talking about a literal fire. Just like whenever Paul the Apostle said that he went to go put wood in the fire, and a serpent bit him on his hand. That's talking about a literal fire. But I'm fixing to show you some places that it ain't talking about a literal fire. The Bible uses the word, the terminology fire to describe several things. And I want you to, and I want to show you some of them here. For example, in Exodus 24, verse number 17, the children of Israel was at the bottom of Mount Sinai after Moses had went up to get the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus 24, verse 17, it says, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Here, the glory of the Lord, when He was given Moses the Ten Commandments and the law of God on top of this mountain, from the bottom of the mountain, it described, it said to the children of Israel that the glory of of the Lord appeared as not just fire, but devouring fire. Okay? Notice how it describes that. Now also see in Deuteronomy, for example, God says, I am a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 4.24, I want you to look at the way some of these verses use the scriptures and or the scriptures use these terminologies. Deuteronomy 4.24 and Hebrews 12.29. Let me put Deuteronomy over here to the side because it says this phrase twice. Deuteronomy 4.24. He tells us, he says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. In Hebrews 12.29, the writer of Hebrews says, for our God is a consuming fire. Whenever I looked up that word consume, it means to consume utterly. <laughs> All right, pretty simple there, right? All right, when you think of something that is being consumed, what is happening? What is happening to that? 
I've been thinking, you know, like if you, I've, people in, like in a, in a house fire or something, they get consumed with smoke. Or you can be consumed with water or you can be consumed with, you know, something is overwhelming. It takes over. It surrounds you. It, it just literally takes over whatever it's consuming is what it is. And whatever's being consumed usually is rendered powerless over under whatever is consuming it. You get what I'm saying? But I looked up the Webster's Dictionary version of it and listened to what it says. And here's where a lot of critics are going to say, aha, I got you. But hold on a minute. The word consume means to destroy. By separating the parts of a thing, by decomposition, as by fire or eating or devouring and annihilating the form of a substance. Fire consumes wood, coal, stubble. Animals consume flesh and vegetables. That's what the definition means. Okay? Now, a lot of critics will say, aha, see there? Our God is a destroying God. All right? Because that word by Webster's Dictionary can mean destroy. All right? Well, that kind of sounds like it goes along with eternal conscious suffering, does it not? But actually, when you stop and think about it, you've got three different outlooks towards the end of mankind. The most popular is what? Eternal conscious suffering, eternal torment. Does anybody know of another one? Annihilation. And then there is the salvation of all. Now, obviously, all three cannot be right. Well, see, people, whenever you're talking about the word destroy, it's hard to work that word into eternal conscious suffering. Matter of fact, the definition of destroy or like, like people call it, you're going to be destroyed forever. God's going to, you know, send destruction, everlasting destruction or something, that mentality. It does not support eternal torment as much as it does annihilation. That thought process goes with annihilation more than it goes with eternal conscious suffering because stop and think about it. They'll use verses of Scripture like, and God's going to destroy His enemies, right? God's going to destroy the wicked. Well, stop and think about this. If something is in eternal destruction mode, for something to be destroyed, there has to come a end there's a point where something is destroyed and then where it's done. So for something to be in an everlasting or an eternal state of destruction, the destroyed part <laughs> never comes. So actually that teaching supports annihilation when you look at it in that realm better than eternal torment because Something that is eternally destroyed or goes through eternal destruction never comes to a finality point. It never comes to that place. So the question arises, all right? The question is, what is God destroying? People? Is He destroying people here? Does God destroy people? And you say, well, yes, He does, Brother Allen. And this is a little bit of the part that I'm wanting to show you. The question is, what is God destroying? Does he destroy people? Turn with me to Genesis 19. I'm going to take you to the place where I guarantee you a lot of critics is going to go and say, well, Brother Allen, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. Yes, he sure did. Turn with me to Genesis and let's actually look at this destruction by fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, was this a physical or a metaphorical fire? I believe it was a physical, literal fire here because they were physical, literal people in a physical, literal city called Sodom and Gomorrah, huh? Right. And that's what we're fixing to look at. See, whenever people, when, when Sodom and Gomorrah in the past has been used in verses and scriptures in messages to the congregation, tell me how are these people let me find the right words. What is the outcome of these people? How has it been assumed? How do we assume what happened to these people? They're, they went to hell, right? That when God reigned, 
And we're going to look at that in for a minute. When God destroyed these people, that everybody automatically assumes that these people at Sodom and Gomorrah went to hell. Okay? Now, stop and think about it. We got sinners, we got fire, and we got destruction. Surely, these three combinations equals hell, right? Well, let's look at these verses of Scripture. And I want you to notice a few things about the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look with me in Genesis verse 19, chapter 19, verse 24. Here he's done brought Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's sending them out. And it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now you hear that? It came down, not up. Where was it? Now think about this. God wrote the Bible, right? God could have did whatever he wanted to do right here. If God wanted to send these people to hell... He could have said, and the devourer, he could have sent Satan after him. Think about it. He could have said, and the fire from Satan come up from hell and destroyed these people. God could have said anything he wanted to right here. But where did the fire come from, and where did it, where did it come from? It come from God, and it come from heaven. These are not the fires of hell. And matter of fact, you will never find one single place in the scriptures where it ever refers to these people going to hell. Matter of fact, this is in Genesis, and you will not find the word hell until the book of Deuteronomy. They were never warned of hell. They were never, Lot never said, get out of here, because he never told Lot, you need to get your family out of here, because I'm fixing to burn these people to hell. Never said it. But what did he do, did say? He says, I am going to utterly destroy this place. And then I believe you can find a reference to this in uh, the New Testament where it refers to the fires of hell being an everlasting fire or something everlasting about Sodom and Gomorrah. It just come to my mind. But let's, Andrew's going to look that up for me. I think it might be in Peter or one of, the, one of those there. But the only fire, and they tried to make that fire into hell fire. But the only fire that is ever mentioned with Sodom and Gomorrah is this fire right here from God, from heaven. All right, now, are those fires still burning? And I believe it uses the word everlasting, which means what? Aeonious, age lasting, abiding fire. In other words, God said, I'm going to literally take these people from off the face of the planet. I believe those fires burnt long enough that even when the next wind blew, the buildings turned to ash. I believe that them cities were totally took off the face of this planet that he, like he said he would. He utterly destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, what did he do to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? What did he do to them? He killed them. He killed them is what he did. All right? Just like we were looking at destroy a while ago or consume. As a dog or an animal consumes food, what happens to that food? Goes to hell? So every time you eat and consume food, that food goes to hell? No, it's not the definition of destroy. That's not the word consume. It means you surround it, you, sub you subdue it, you you overwhelm it is what consume means. Where it says in the New Testament, what's the phrase that it uses for Sodom and Gomorrah? Jude, yeah. What does it say? Of eternal fire. And you look up that word eternal and it's the word aeon. It's the word aeon, which means an age. In other words, that fire burnt for as long as it needed to burn. That fire's not burning anymore. Is that fire burning anymore? 
And you say, well, that's talking about hell. Show me that. Show me where the Bible ever says that Sodom and Gomorrah were suffering from the fires of hell. The fires of hell is never mentioned. Matter of fact, it's fire from heaven. That's where the fires come from. All right? Now remember, Hebrews and Deuteronomy both tell us, for God, our God is a consuming fire. He consumed that place, did he not? There was no escaping. Okay? Here's another point about it. We've all heard and assumed that the people of Sodom went to hell. But notice this, guys. You talk to anybody in church about Sodom and Gomorrah and ask them, any, uh, anybody, what happened to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah whenever God killed them? They went to hell. All right? They automatically assume that. Everybody's heard that. But yet the scriptures never teach that, never say that, never mention it, never even hint it to be that way. But yet that's the assumption that every single person always has. But yet you look over in Ezekiel, and you guys have seen this, but in Ezekiel 16.55, Ezekiel prophesies of Sodom's restoration. But yet the funny thing about it is the same people that's heard that Sodom and Gomorrah or assume that Sodom and Gomorrah went to hell when they died, they've never heard of Ezekiel's prophecy of that. That is a perfect example, ladies and gentlemen, of how fire is being mistaught and only used for scare tactic purposes. You've heard of them being destroyed. Matter of fact, they've added to the story by saying that God sent them to hell, which is not true. But yet what the Bible does teach about Sodom and Gomorrah, they've never heard it. Think about that. How ironic is that? They're hearing things that the Bible don't teach, and they're not hearing what it does teach. And they accuse us of changing things. That's exactly right. They accuse us, us, us of being the ones that are, we're Bible correctors. <laughs> no, I'm Baptist corrector is what I am, doggone them. Malachi, turn with me to Malachi. These are some pretty interesting verses of Scripture. It's the last book of the uh, Old Testament, right before Matthew. Turn with me to Malachi chapter number 3, and listen to what the scriptures say. Now remember, I know I didn't really get stay on, I know I really didn't stay on the lake of fire, but we're going to get back to that in just a few minutes. In the book of Malachi, chapter number 3, read with me beginning in verse number 2. He says, But who may abide the day of His coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now listen, he says... when now. Listen to what he says. Who may abide the day of his what? Coming. He's talking about when he comes back. Who shall stand? He said, nobody's going to stand. And he's asking the question, who's going to do that? It's so funny, Scott. Religious people in churches, they want to throw judgment all on people that don't go to church or believe the way they do. And they talk about how God's going to come back and judge this mess. Yeah, you're exactly right. They talk as if believers are not going to be judged. We shall all be judged, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Believers don't skip out of the, the judging process. The problem is, is, the reason they want to do that, they've made God's judgments into a Saul movie. I mean, they've... They've taken the judgments of God and turned them into a story, brother, that makes Saul seem like a Disney classic. I mean, at least with Saul, you can get out, maybe. If you can pass the tests. 
<clears throat> but they've turned this into a horror story. And they've turned God's judgments into horror stories. He says, and he's asking, who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? That sounds to me like he's talking to everybody. And I think he's asking a question. I don't think any of us are. Nobody's going to stand and say, I can make it through this. I've done this. I've done that. God's judgments are going to humble us all, son. And what is he doing here? How does he describe? Now, he's talking about the tribe of Levi here. He is talking to Israel here. But take the same teaching and apply it. What is he doing to the tribe of Levi? He's refining them. And he's doing it with fire. He says, he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. God's divine fire has always cleansed, purged, and took away the dross. We'll get to that verse of scripture. See how he's using that terminology? And he shall sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. In other words, after the purifying process, what are they going to do? What's the end result? He's going to, they're going to offer him an offering. Of, in other words, he's got to clean them up first. He ain't just, he's not refining them just to throw them away. He's refining them, refining them so they can bring up an offering of righteousness. Now, Malachi's pretty interesting. You go back and he's talking about these same priests robbing God. And by the way, in, in chapter 3, verse 8, this is free for you. I ain't charging you for this one. Will a man rob God? He ain't talking to the congregation. He's talking to the hypocrites to call themselves priests that were keeping all the good sacrifices to themselves and offering God the leftovers. But yet these verses of scriptures are used by preachers to point their finger at you to get you to give more money. Whenever Malachi ain't talking to the congregation, Malachi is talking about the head honchos that are in charge that are misusing the money. <laughs> That's who's robbing God Malachi, fuller soap, refiner's fire. God is a refiner. I love this one. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter number 1. Again, he's talking to and about Israel. But listen to the way he's using fire and he's describing this situation and this story. Isaiah 1 25. And he says, and I will turn my hand upon thee. And purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy uh, tin. All right? What is dross? Do y'all know what dross is? It's the yuck. It's the leftover. It's what they cleanse off the top. When you melt, when you melt metal, especially gold and silver, the impurities that are in that gold will separate from the pureness of the gold and will literally separate and they skim that junk off the top. And the more you do that, the more pure it becomes. And sometimes it's a process. It takes more than one. It takes more than one time to get all the dross out of metal. You might have to work with it. You might have to, it might have to happen a few times before it actually gets to where he, he wants it. And he says, and take away all thy tin. Say what? You work with metal, that's right. So you know the process. Well, that's what God says He's going to do to these folks. Now, remember, Old Testament, what is it? Shadow. Shadow of things to come. Okay? Keep reading with me. After He purely purges and takes away the dross, and I will restore thy judges as at the first. In other words, I'm going to put back. Notice this. And thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness. 
the faithful city. See, in Isaiah, when they were disobedient, he called them the disobedient people, a gainsaying people. You make me sick and you've ticked me off. That's what half the time you hear God talking about Israel. They're a disobedient people. They've turned their back on me. But here he's talking about, I'm going to purely purge away this dross. I will restore that that your judges. He says, as the counselors, as at the beginning, and afterward, after that, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. It's a beautiful picture, guys, of what destruction and God's judgment. And listen in verse 27. Zion, talking about that faithful city, that's another word for that. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. And her converts with righteousness. Redeemed with judgment. Keep that in mind, guys. Redeemed with judgment. <laughs> Not burnt with judgment. Not thrown in the trash can forever with judgment. Not eternal, everlasting. God's going to whoop you forever and ever and ever. You will be redeemed. What does redeemed meant mean? You, I remember redeeming bottles. They were worth something. You got to redeem a bottle, they're paying for it. Something paid for, okay? He shall be redeemed with judgment and their converts with righteousness. So we see that. We see him saying, I'm going to turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy draws. Now, we're going to, you've seen these these few verses of scriptures of what God's going to do, the divine fire of God, how his fire appeared, his glory appeared as fire. So we see the glory of God. We say, we see when he comes back, he's going to sit as a refiner's fire. Okay. Now let's go to the end. Revelation. Back to, we're going to be in Revelation 20. And here are two similar verses. I want you to Listen to, and here's kind of the point of this message. Sodom and Gomorrah was a good picture of half the story. How you've heard of their destruction. You've been made to assume they have been sent to hell forever despite the Bible not saying that. And what the Bible does say about Sodom and Gomorrah, you've never heard it. Okay? And that's not by accident. Revelation chapter number 20 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 are two verses of Scripture that can be looked at and compared. Let's start with Revelation chapter number 20 right quick. This is the great white throne, judgment. Keep that in mind. Great white throne, judgment. What was God redeeming with a few minutes ago in Isaiah? Judgment. You shall be redeemed with judgment. Okay. Verse 12, And I saw a dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to what? According to their works. Listen, so we've got works. We've got people's works being judged here. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Now, those verses of scriptures have been made a nightmare to you and me. This has been told that this is the end destruction of the wicked. This is the final destruction of the wicked. But I want to stop and ask you. Somebody said, I was reading this, and check this out and see if y'all see this. Look in verse number 14. People's always often asked, what is the second death? What is the second death? Is it the great white throne judgment? Is it the lake of fire? Well, this one article kind of made a pretty good sense to me. 
He answers that verse in the same that, that question in the same verse. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Think about that for a minute. What's going on in the lake of fire? Remember what we asked a while ago? What does God destroy? What is God, is God destroying people right here? All right? Stop and think about this. The second death. This was pretty interesting. This, this verse of scripture is kind of like saying this. See if I tell you, I'm telling you the same phrase. I'm just saying it in two different ways. A track of land completely sound, surrounded by water. This is an island. All right? An island is a track of land completely surrounded by water. Say the same thing, say it two different ways, right? Apply that to verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, do it the other way. The second death is death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. What is the second death? I believe the second death is the death of death. You say, what are you talking about, Brother Allen? Well, what does 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 22 tell us? And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This lake of fire right here, this fire, this consuming fire, this refining fire, this purging fire, this destroying fire is not destroying people. It's, resto it's destroying anything pertaining to death. It is getting rid of death. And I've heard people say, well, the first death is very similar to the second death. I know people that believe that this second death is a literal death. I do not believe it's a literal death. Because stop and think about this, guys. Jesus says, I've come to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. The Bible tells us that all will be made alive. Look who's being judged here in verse number 12. Who's being judged? The dead. <laughs> so God's going to kill dead people. See, my question is, all right, they done. the Bible calls them you're dead in trespasses and sins. Then you're going to die physically. Here he's calling them dead again, but then he's going to turn around and physically kill them again? My question is, is when does the life come into play here? You get what I'm saying? Like how many times has he got to... For something, for somebody to be a so... For bringing life. Sure is a lot of killing going on and a lot of dying. I'm ready for some life, ain't you? Well, what's the death of death? You kill death, what happens? Do you know death is an entity? Death has dominion over you. But when God takes that dominion off of you, God kills death, what happens? People start coming alive, don't they? I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, you see where people are being judged according to their works and they're being judged in a place called the lake of fire. Okay? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and let's compare and look at this verse and we're going to shut her down after this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And what's so funny, I've heard these two verses of Scripture compared in religious churches and they call Revelation chapter number 20 the judgment of the unsaved and they call 1 Corinthians chapter 3 the judgment of the saved and I'm going to show you why <laughs> why they separate the two read with me beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 verse number 12 now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, I automatically see two groups of things right there, don't you? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work, all right, who's he talking to right here? 
I don't mean to get over your head here. Every man's work shall be made known, made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's what? Work. Here we got works being tried by fire. Tried means what? Tested, judged. Same, same thing. Every man, and, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now think about this. Back in verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Fire affects those two groups of things differently, do they not? Look in verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a, a reward. So in other words, all the gold, silver, and precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, those things represent our work. Those is what's being tried. Now, if they abide, you shall re receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. <laughs> but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So here we've got a saving fire, don't we? Their works are being judged by fire. Their works, whether they're wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone, is being destroyed or either made known. You get what's going on? But he himself, what happens to the person himself? What's burning up right here in this fire? Works, the wood, hay, stubble. That's what's burning up. That's what's destroyed. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now you go look at the wordage used in these verses of Scripture compared to Revelation chapter 20 with the great white throne judgment. People are being judged by fire and their works are being judged by fire. <laughs> now you tell me why Why does people separate those two? It's because then he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. See, that's why they make it. Well, that's about believers. Revelation is about unbelievers. Let me ask you something. If God's fire has always purified, cleansed, and purged, and is going to save these people, why is it going to be any different to the other crowd? Why does that fire suddenly change at the end of time? Why suddenly, all of a sudden, that's an eternal torturing fire? When you've not heard of an eternal torturing fire, nowhere in the scriptures. But suddenly they make revelation, the lake of fire, an eternal torturing fire. Whenever, I've heard nothing but, a, you say, well, a destroying fire, but how many times we got to go over that, guys? It doesn't mean torture chamber. It means took down to nothing. Absolutely. If you have built upon wood, hay, and stubble. In other words, if you've lived your whole life selfishly, pridefully, arrogantly, never helped nobody, everything you believed was false. If you had no foundation, you will suffer loss when that fire hits your works. But he himself shall be saved. You know why? Because God's not destroying people here. Right. Right. You know, and it just kind of makes me feel like when the kingdom, God's helpers, the believers, we're going to be left with those people whose works have been destroyed. Amen. But the people are there. The people are there. That's what the believers will do. 
Amen. Me too, sis. That's what I believe what was go what's going on. I think that's why Amen. I do too. Right. Right. Oh, you hear Christians talk about ruling and reigning with God. You listen to their attitudes. We're going to rule and reign with God. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> you listen to them. Yes, I mean, they feel like, <laughs> yeah, full of pride and arrogance when they think about that. Like, yeah, this is our time. We get to get them back now. Is that a Christ-like attitude? Do you really think Jesus is coming back going, ha, ha? Right. We're more like teachers. Well, you think about, he says, we shall be kings and priests with him. What did the priests do? The priests took the offerings from the people and offered them unto God for the forgiveness of their sin. In other words, the priests were the middlemen between the sinners and God, metaphorically. I believe we're going to be the middlemen. We're the ones... You're being trained right now to do what you're going to do in the future ages. That's why God's taught you to love your enemies now. How many of you changed your attitude towards the world since you've come to know the salvation of all? How many of you look at sinners differently? Well, guess what? You couldn't have done your job looking at them the old way through eternal torment because you'd have been like, ha ha, you deserve to burn, you old stinking sinner. But no, God's changed your heart. God's changed your mind. Now you know that person's just a sinner. You know why? He's not been chosen to believe yet. How can, he even, how can you even blame that man whenever you've got to be chosen by God? I hear people say, I chose God. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. God chose you. So now, God has given you that compassion. God has given you that understanding. And that mind of Christ, so that when we do drop these robes of flesh, I agree with you. And another story it reminds me of, right quick in closing, with this fire, of what how the fire. Back in London, remember when the Black Plague was in London, I believe? Was it London? All over Europe. But the Black Plague has spread, was killing thousands of people. Well, it was around that same time that I believe the fires of London broke out. Okay? And it was, if not tragic enough with the Black Plague, now London's on fire. But one thing people noticed that after the fire subsided, the plague was gone. It had killed the pestilences in the streets. It killed the, the disease-carrying mice and animals that was in the streets. And you say, well, Brother Allen, how many people died in those fires? How many people were dying because of the plague? It didn't change the death rate. The fire, the point is, the fire brought an end to the plague. God's going to bring an end to this plague called sin. The lake of fire is where anything pertaining to death is burnt up. that he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The fire of God, the divine fire of God, it's his power, it's his glory, it's his majesty, it's his rule. The divine fire represents the divine law of God. God is going to set up his rule on this planet. This earth talked about it's going to burn with a fervent heat, right? God's judgments are going to be all over. God's judgments are going to consume this earth. Amen? I don't believe this is a literal fire. Not this fire. Lord, thank you. We don't know what's to come. But Lord, we know what the end results are for your word has told us. We don't know exactly the way your judgments are going to be performed. They are described with fire. And our flesh sometimes cringes at that, Lord. 
But when we read of what you do with fire, that you are a consuming fire. Lord, we know what the results are going to be. You're cleaning up, you're going to cleanse us. You're going to purge away the bad. You're going to make us more pure. You're going to refine us. And that goes for all of us. I'm thankful, Lord, that the 15 years that I was in religion, you put it to the fire and it burned up right before my eyes. I was living in falsehoods. I was living in deception and deceit. And your fire revealed that. I'm thankful that, Lord, we're not where we need to be, but, Lord, we're heading in that direction. And I thank you for this ministry. Thank you for these people. Thank you for those that watch. Thank you for bringing us together and other men and women around this world that is preaching the true good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll send encouragement to them, that you'll send knowledge to them and wisdom let us all learn together and share it, Lord, as we're going to do in the future ages. But, Lord, we're not going to have these bodies in the future. We're not going to be hindered in the future. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for blessing us, God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, Lord, we thank you, and it's all because of him. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, guys. Have a wonderful good rest of the evening, and we'll see y'all next Sunday. Anything going on between uh, next, excuse me, Wednesday? Nothing's going on between now and next Wednesday, is it? Okay. December 10th, Christmas breakfast. Remember it. Put it on your calendar. Please be there, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Love you in the Lord.